My name is Father Gregory Pine, and I am delighted to join you for this most recent, this next installment of Off Campus Conversations. Uh, and today I am joined by Professor Angela Noble. So, Professor Noble, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excellent. So, um, many of the folks who listen to the Thomistic Institute podcast will know you from contributions that you've made in the past or lectures that have been on the podcast regarding. Uh, the abortion debate, uh, specifically like the feminist argument, the burden argument, and then things about the virtues, which is where it seems you specialize. Um, but for those who don't know you, would you just say a word about who you are, where you're from, what you do, any pertinent details? Sure. Uh, my name is Angela Knoble. Um, I teach at the University of Dallas. Uh, I've been teaching at the University of Dallas since January of uh, 2021. Before that, I was at the Catholic University of America for 16 years. Um, I mostly work on Thomas Aquinas and his theory of virtue and uh, specifically his view that some virtues are given us by God um, as a kind of side interest generated really by teaching in the classroom. Um, I also kind of dabble in the abortion debate and annexed issues, um, which are, are the topic of today's conversation. Okay. Um, so first off, Sorry for stealing or depriving you of your hard K. I think I've been calling it's you. It's okay. I married into the hard K. It's, yeah, it's, my bad. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. It, so. Yeah, yeah well, no, that's that's on me. Poor research. It's a Swiss um, thing. It's a Swiss thing. Is it thing. really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Okay. All right. I believe it. Um, being in Switzerland, I should have greater sympathy to the hard K. But alas, there here I am, unchanged. Um, Okay, so maybe transitioning then directly into the topic at hand, which is the abortion debate. <clears throat> I think kind of taking the temperature or feeling the pulse of 20th or 21st century participants in this conversation, I think a lot of, pe a lot of people have begun to or have already despaired of the discourse. Man, Father Gregory, speak more clearly. Sweet Christmas. Okay, so a lot of people, when they hear abortion, they're like, I am not going to have a fruitful conversation <laughs> about this. Um, whether they think that just practically or whether they think that speculatively, it's like we live in this kind of post-apocalyptic nightmare of discourse. Um, for those who feel this way, uh, words of encouragement. Have you found that this debate is actually possible? Uh, have you found places in which to host it? Maybe what are the most propitious places in which you have hosted it? Maybe just a word to set, set the stage. Sure. I mean, if you don't mind, I'm going to go all the way back to, you know, when I first got a job as a um, tenure track professor, fresh out of grad school with a dissertation on Thomas Aquinas in hand. I was assigned to teach applied ethics because what else would you teach? You know, I mean, you're an ethicist, you can teach applied ethics. Um, and I really, um, I really struggled, right? Because I had this feeling like, oh, crap, abortion, like, who wants to talk about this? It's going to be very strained. Everybody's going to be angry. Um, but when I sat down to kind of prepare my lessons, you know, I realized something really important. And that was that I had a lifetime of opinions about abortion. And I knew nothing, really, about the philosophical questions at stake. Right, that I had never really looked at the, the really kind of hard, interesting, complicated, philosophical questions that are at the heart of the abortion debate. And when you do that, and when you realize how interested, interesting they are and how difficult they are, all of a sudden you have a way of talking about this very vexed, controversial issue that does not go right away to emotion. Right. Because there's a way when, when <laughs> there's a way of focusing the conversation on the rational questions that brings the tone down. Right. If I go in, um, if you know, if you and I have a conversation and uh, about abortion and I say, well, Father Pine, you hate women. You're opposed to abortion. You hate women. How can you do this? automatically, right? Your, um, your guard is up, right? Um, or, or if, um, if I say, look, I'm opposed to abortion because I don't believe in murdering babies, right? Uh, and automatically, right? But if we approach the conversation differently and we say, what, what exactly 
do people who support abortion like what exactly are the print are, are the arguments like what it what is what is a person right what is it <laughs> why might it be can why might somebody consider it just to sometimes take the life of the child they're carrying like if you really kind of go right to the hard and interesting arguments that people have i think that you can bring some civility to the discussion just because you're making an honest attempt to give your opponent right their due right i mean what how often do we really try to understand the people that we disagree with instead of just like giving a soundbite, right? Which we then post on Twitter and that guy burn, right? Uh, <laughs> but if we really try to understand each other, um, A, right, our, the person we're talking to feels heard, right? Because they need and want to be understood. B, we might realize that there are deficiencies in our own understanding, right? We might be able to move forward. Now, are we going to, you know, run out and, and change everybody's minds right away? No, right? But to the extent that you come away from a classroom discussion or a TI talk with, with the feeling that you better grasp what the argument is about, I think you've succeeded, right? Because, you know, you may realize that for you, the fundamental question is personhood, Right. Um, and now you understand why some people think the fetus is a person and some people don't. Or you you may now think, okay, yeah, I get it. Really, for me, the question is whether a woman can be asked to carry these like really great burdens. And you understand why some people think she can and some people think she can't. But you've you've added some clarity, right? And and I just think that in our culture, we run right to we don't think we need clarity because we all think we're experts on everything. And we run right to the sound bites. And what we really need to do is listen charitably to the people we disagree with. Um, okay. I want to push on this just a little bit because I think that you might be more committed to the discourse than I am, um, which is awesome. So I want to, yeah, I want to just push on that a little bit. Okay. Okay. So why? I'm thinking about my context. I live in Switzerland. Oftentimes the ecumenical conversation in Switzerland is very difficult for Catholics to participate in without it becoming a least common denominator kind of assimilative latitudinarianism. And so I think that my desire for discourse may actually have lessened on account of the fact that I see what is in fact a lot of kind of strong arming mock discourse. So I think, okay, thinking about the abortion debate, I worry that if I have to comport myself with civility in certain circumstances, I might be thought the sympathetic. And, you know, like our culture is very concerned with kind of like identity and mission and being <clears throat> identif identifiably um, and missionarily. I'm just making stuff up now at this point. Um, you know, like uh, one way or the other. I don't know if that's, you know, just tribalistic or if there is something good to that. Um, so that's like, I'm thinking about that on the one hand. And then also thinking with, you know, this particular debate, you know, you think about the American context. I don't know the exact statistics of the last decade, but the last time I checked, it was like 600,000 children were aborted each year. Um, and I think that when you focus on individual persons and the possibility that this person could think otherwise or think differently or think better, that's encouraging. But when you think about it in the grand scale, I think a lot of people are dis discouraged from participating in the abortion debate in the honest way that you describe, because it seems taken kind of grosso modo, it just seems diabolical. Um, so it's the type of thing that people, again, for that reason, don't want to touch, not, not only with a 10 foot pole, with like a 5 billion foot pole. Um, okay. So, you know, I'm appealing to your belief in the discourse. Can you maybe sure. say a word, a further word to convince me that this is something that I can enter into and not and not lose myself in, I suppose that's the principal concern. I want to, it's so funny that you use the word discourse, um, because if any students um, of mine from the University of Dallas ethics <laughs> class uh, uh, watch this, they, they'll find the humor in it too, because um, we just, 
so we just finished the uh, semester. We had, you know, survey of ethics. Um, we just finished it with um, uh, an, an example of applied ethics, right? So I kind of wanted to show them how the people we've covered in the class, right? How, how, what the, how would they apply that in practice? And they voted and they chose to read um, Rosalind Hursthouse's Virtue Theory and Abortion. I don't know if you're familiar. Are you familiar with that article at all? So, you know, she, um, she tried, she, tries to strike a, a rather moderate tone, right? So she says, look, you know, um, the, the abortion discourse talks about women's rights. It, you know, it talks about the personhood of the fetus. But look, even if we, uh, we agree, as she thinks we should, that a woman has a right to her body, um, there are situations in which it can be unvirtuous not all, right? She's, she's in, she thinks sometimes abortion can be kind, but she thinks sometimes abortion can be selfish, unkind, callous, right? Um, that it can lack virtue. And so she sees herself, Rosalind herself sees herself as kind of like, look, I'm balanced, right? I'm talking to both sides. And it was interesting in the one class, one section hated this article. Um, the other section, I don't think read the article as carefully as the first section. Um, <laughs> they were like, well, this is, gr this is great. This is great. Um, and I said, that's interesting. Why, why do you like this? I happen to know that most of you who think this is great disagree with her on abortion. They said, they said, discourse, discourse, right? Cause, you know, we have, we have common ground now. We can, you know, she's agreed that, right? Um, and, and I, um, put on the Father Pine hat, I suppose, because I said, discourse, right? You guys think abortion is murder. Why do you want to have discourse, right? So I, I actually, this, that long, complicated story was just to, to point out that, that I um, spoke with the same derision of the word discourse that, that you just probably more, more derision than you just exhibited. Now, but I want to make a distinction, right, about, about discourse, right, about the kind of conversation that I want to have. I don't think that anyone, Right. And in fact, I think this is where we got to our present situation. I don't think that anyone should go into an, a conversation, right, about their religion, about their beliefs, about whatever, with the idea of tamping down what they really think. So they come across in a friendlier, more kind of, you know, you like me, I like you. If I'm hiding what I think, that's dangerous, right? And John Stuart Mill, actually, in his essay on liberty, he says the same thing. He says, right, we, you're just lying, right? You're just presenting this, this falsehood, right? And I, I know, Father Pine, how you feel about lying. And I, I agree with you on that. <laughs> but um, I, um, I agree. I, that's true. But what I want to point out, right, is we can have a serious conversation about why Father Pine thinks abortion is murder, and you, the you know the Judith Jarvis Thompson follower, do not think it's murder. We can have that conversation. We can use the M word, right? And the M word being murder, right? We can have that conversation without devolving into shouting, because how how can we? How is that possible? Because we can talk about what murder is, right? And we can talk about, right, the fact that we both agree that murder is unjust killing, right? And we can recognize that you think that the killing of an unborn child is the kind of paradigmatic instance of unjust killing, and that many people think that the killing of an unborn child is not unjust at all, right? But a very justified thing. And then we can realize, wow, we disagree about what justice is. Right. And we can push things all the way back. And I have never crossed the line into smarminess. Right. I have never kind of hid what I think and kind of dialogued and kind of like d done this because what what I'm doing when I when I do the sort of thing that you don't like and I don't like is I'm being patronizing. Right. People know when they're being sold a line of goods and what we have to be is be honest. Right. But we also have to be honest about what our view commits us to, right? We have to be willing to push the discussion back. We have to be genuinely curious about why other people see the issue differently. 
And for me, this, this was a real, um, you know, to go back to teaching, which is what generated my interest in this, this is like for a real watershed moment to me, right? Because um, I was really worried when I first started, I just wanted my students to have the right views, right? I just like, oh, you know. Um, and so I really worried about kind of my tone of voice and, you know, like, did they, were they coming out? Did, are, do my students get my opinion? You know, do, are they aware of this? Um, and gradually I became aware that I didn't know enough, right? And when I genuinely became interested in the questions at stake, I became a lot more confident in leading the class because I had something to talk about, right? Um, and uh, to me, you know, I, um, I just gave, it wasn't, it was the one TI, the one talk on abortion I gave this year that was not a TI talk on abortion. Um, there were, had a little debate at Glendale Community College. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I met one of the professors there. The professor went online and kind of found the TI PowerPoint that I use um, in um, the philosophy of the abortion debate. And he said, hey, can I use this in class? Like, I, I want to use this. And I said, sure, right, Glendale Community College, you can use my PowerPoint on abortion. And he wrote me a few months later and he said, you know what? My students, right, who are not the typical TI audience, right, by any stretch, he said, they found that so helpful because nobody had ever described the philosophy behind the question before, right? We all jump, right? And so, and this was the other concern that you mentioned, like we all jump, oh, do people know how we think? Wait, am I gonna seem to advocate this? Wait, right? And we all kind of, that's a shortcut. I, that, if there's one thing I believe very firmly, we cannot take shortcuts when it comes to moral questions. We cannot take shortcuts when it comes to this question. We have to listen. And I feel like both sides um, uh, I have, have tried to take shortcuts, right? Um, and what, is it, what has it done? It has, it has, I don't know what the right word is, but it has polarized our nation right? Because I don't want to hear, I'm not going to, I'm not going to admit that you have anything good to say, you Planned Parenthood person, right? I, I, I'm not going to listen. We're going to shut it down, right? And what do the, what do they say in return? You pro-life person, right? You are vicious. You're motivated by the patriarchy, like, and, and then we just shout at each other, right? We degenerate, as Alistair McIntyre says, into shrillness. We have to talk. And you're right. It is a risk, it is a risk. Absolutely. Right. The first time I have this kind of horrible memory from way back, probably you weren't even in college yet. Right. It was, I think it was 2005. Right. I was a new professor. Um, I had this kid. He was like campus ministry, this campus ministry, that straight A student. Right. Um, I was, we're in the abortion section of the applied ethics class. Uh, we read I had assigned Judith Jarvis Thompson. He walks into class. He goes, Dr. McKay. This was before I was married. Dr. McKay, thank you. Thank you for assigning that, that paper because I always thought I was pro-life and now I realize I'm not, right? But you take a risk, right? You have to, whether we like it or not, <clears throat> Judith Jarvis Thompson appeals at a visceral level to very many people. And we just try and skirt over that and say, violinist, I'm not going to talk about violinist. Like We're missing that. We have to ask ourselves, why is this viscerally appealing? What does she get? What does she latch on to? What do I think about what she latches on to? Is there something right there? Is there something wrong there? We have to have those conversations. We can't take shortcuts. Um, yeah. No, I, it's interesting. Like what you describe, I've had a couple of experiences of this idea. Like, so trying to sympathize as it were with the other side, producing a, an appreciable gain or like a, a good fruit. One, one was listening to the, the talk that you gave uh, specifically about the burden argument. And you were talking about how, okay, yeah, like it's good to acknowledge the fact that it is a burden. Uh, I mean, inequitable burdens are baked into society or they're just baked into life in the body, right? With all of its contingent and um, kind of unforeseen circumstances. And, but then you were saying, 
it seems to me like the move would be to valorize motherhood, right? Rather than a lot of young mothers, when they go to the supermarket with their three kids, they're asked like whether they know about contraception yet and are just forced to reckon with uh, a lot of unpleasant conversations. Uh, but what if we were like Spartans, you know, who uh, afforded to mothers the same dignities afforded to a soldier fallen in battle? Like what if we kind of tended more in that direction? It would seem to alleviate some of the perceived burden, uh, though the material conditions would remain the same. I remember thinking that like, yeah, I, I remember calling my sister Rebecca, who at that time had like a three-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old and a newborn. And I was like, let's go. I was like, kudos to you, my <laughs> friend. For every time I've rolled my eyes from the pulpit when one of your children said something wild in the middle <laughs> of a homily, my sincere apologies. Um, another thing, too, was I read this essay on first things about, about abortion argumentation. And it was citing studies done by, uh, it was like Caring International, or I've forgotten what the name of it was. <clears throat> but what they kind of found in their research was that it wasn't so much a choice of whether or not to kill a child. For, for many women, it was perceived as a choice of who dies. Um, so it's either I die or the child dies. And by I die, I mean like my future or my freedom or my security or my perception of myself as a good mother, or, you know, any number of ways in which that could be spun out. And so they launched a whole campaign of advertisements just like showing confident, powerful women, like in the workplace or wherever. Like I remember one coming off the back of a fire engine, just being like, hey, what's up? You know, with like soot on her face, um, saying like, I, ha I brought the child to term. Maybe I kept it. Maybe I put the child up for adoption, but it didn't kill me, you know? And in fact, they found that that was super effective. Um, so maybe that's just by way of, of confirmation. I don't know that I have anything further as a question, but that corresponds. So thanks. Um, I... I, I want to ask a couple of follow-ups when it comes to... It turns out that this is just going to be about discourse because I find this really fascinating and I think that <laughs> abortion is a great place in which to motivate the question. Um, so you mentioned this one article which appeals to, you know, you're hooked up to a violinist and if you unhook yourself from the violinist, the violinist dies. Um, so my experience is like with philosophy of mind, I come across this, that a lot of the thought experiments which are deployed are very... Uh, let's say non-intuitional or a-intuitional and that they're trying to motivate our moral intuitions. And I guess for me, uh, my reaction is maybe moral intuitions aren't all they're cracked up to be. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know if you've thought about this or if you have things to share about this, but what are the place of moral intuitions uh, in this abortion debate, especially in the 21st century when our moral intuitions, I think culturally are just so wonky. Um, uh, so, so how, you know, like to, to whom do we appeal or what part of the person do we appeal to? Uh, well, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned moral intuitions because I, I do think, um, you can, cl you can clarify and clarify and clarify. Um, but at the end of the day, um, when we're discussing something like abortion, we reach a kind of bedrock moral intuition. Um, and some people go one way and some people go another way. Right. I mean, so, um, you know, I, I like to argue, as you probably know that, that, um, you know, that how you respond to the Judith Jarvis Thompson type argument kind of depends on, on your, your foundational view about justice and about whether you think you have obligations can have obligations that you didn't ask for right? And obligations you didn't sign up for. Um, and people, when you kind of frame it that way, people really have deep-seated, um, contrary inclinations about that, right? I know several people who just say, no, sorry, I don't care if you're dying of thirst and I have water. I don't, I have no moral obligation to give you any water, right? It's, I'm not doing anything unjust. And other people say of course, of course you are, right? Of course I owe that person something. And so that's a, at, at, at a certain point, right? When we've had the conversation, we've clarified everything, we've listened to each other. At a certain point, I think we very are likely to come up against a kind of fundamental moral difference, right? And um, I think you're saying, I don't know, you can, you can tell me I'm wrong. I think you're saying, where do we go from there, right? I mean, if, if we've... Um, and and I had a colleague, right? He um, he was. I had asked him to to write a paper. He he has a paper about abortion that I really like. I always assign it in class. And I had asked him to kind of 
revise it for a, a collection of essays I was putting together. And, and he, he said the same thing. It was like at a certain point, right? It just, uh, my intuition about personhood and, and someone else's intuition about personhood, they're gonna, we're gonna clash. We can clarify the principle, but, um, but there might be a clash. I think that's true. But here is what I would say. Um, this is one of my, the one, you know, you hardly ever feel like you succeed as a teacher. Um, I had this one, this one time, right? The times I can count on my hand, but I felt like I succeeded as a teacher. Um, I had this student who was kind of very gung ho, outspoken, pro choice, like very smart, really fun to have in class, really challenging. And I was like, crap, okay, abortion. <laughs> um, and she took the class and, you know, she, um, she got the A. It was, it was very civil, um, whatever. A colleague of mine who knew kind of knew her views about things um, ran into her after the after she'd taken the class. And he was like, yeah, how was that? You know, um, and she said she was like, yeah, it was good. She was like. After taking that class, I, just, I don't even want to talk about abortion anymore because it's just it's so complicated. I didn't change her mind. Right. I didn't change her mind. We, her bedrock intuition disagreed with my bedrock intuition, but it made her think. If she ever gets to the point where she's on her second child, right? And, um, and she's a mother, she realizes that maybe she, she may someday realize that maybe she doubts that bedrock intuition. She may someday realize that she thinks maybe she does owe somebody something or that she thinks that somebody owes her child something. If she ever can, comes to doubt that bedrock intuition, most of the rest of the work is done, right? And I, so I don't know, I, I, I don't know that we're ever gonna, look, we, we just, it, we can't try and do everything all at once, right? I mean, but you can put the pieces in place, right? So you're not gonna change people's minds. No, my class is not gonna change people's minds. If I did, I would, I would probably be doing it wrong. But you can put the pieces in place that if to make that change of mind more likely to happen, to make um, to make those those kind of moments of insight possible. Right. You can you you can um, if you set your sights lower um, and just do what you can do, I think you can set the stage for a lot. OK, this next question is a mess of ideas. So I'm going to just give voice to that mess of ideas, throw a question mark on at the end, and then you can have at it as you see fit. Um, so I'm reading the confessions right now. Uh, again, those of you who are scandalized by the fact that I may not have read it up until my 34th year of life, be at peace. Um, and I'm very struck by the fact that like St. Augustine is seemingly perpetually anguished and paralyzed until the moment that he's not. Okay, so what you just described with respect to the abortion debate, you're probably not going to change too terribly many people's minds, but you might destabilize their fundamental intuitions insofar as those fundamental intuitions do not cleave to the truth. Um, and I'm thinking about Augustine. You know, he's convicted as to the truth of the faith, right? A lot of his opposition is dealt with by the preaching of St. Ambrose, and he formerly thought of God in strange anthropomorphic ways, and had that dealt with and got over his Manichaean phase and Platonism led him to the light. And then he meets some cool Christians and he's moved by these rhetoricians who leave their public employ and embrace the practice of the faith. And it seems to me that he comes to a point of attrition and mild repentance, but that he's just still caught in the grips of, yeah, his immoral life. And then in book nine, nope, book eight, it's it's testimony, you know, so like a guy comes over, he tells the story of St. Anthony of the Desert, and he's talking about how these other guys, they, they heard St. Anthony of the Desert's store, and then they entered this monastery, and he's like, holy smokes, I want that. And then within that setting, he hears the voice to take up and read, and he does, and then boom. So I'm thinking about your role as a teacher in the classroom, and I'm wondering how far is your role from a teacher in the classroom from that of a preacher in the pulpit? Because I'm thinking like Evangelio Nunziandi, the world has need of witnesses. If the world listens to teachers, it's going to listen to them because they're also witnesses. And when it comes to this particular thing, it strikes me that it's so incredibly important for a person's flourishing, just on those terms, and eternal salvation in eternal terms. Um, like, 
how do you how do you channel that? Do you do you think of yourself as a witness? Is that something that you hope to cultivate? Is that something that you're kind of growing in or developing as we speak? And then question mark. That's what I've come to at this point. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. I, I I mean, so I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna say something that's not directly. I mean, it's a little bit on topic. I mean, before I answer your question about witness, I mean, you, it's interesting you brought up the confessions, which is a story of conversion, right? And I do think that your views on things like abortion, um, uh, ultimately, take often take the character of conversion. Right. Not a not the conclusion of a demonstrative proof like, oh, OK. Right. I, I do think that there is a moment of conversion there. And I think that's that's why I don't necessarily that's part of why I don't see that as my job. Right. I don't you don't cause conversion. You, you can you can facilitate it or work towards it. But I really like actually what you said about witness. And I think I think witness is so important um, because I think that. Um, one, I think that you're doing something very powerful when you speak unapologetically about what you believe, right? Um, that in itself is a power, uh, the, you know, they've done, they did, they've done psychological studies, you know, I'm sure you've all heard, you've heard about these like prison experiments or like, you know, you're there, so the person's asked to shock someone until the point of death or something like that. And, uh, people do it, right? Because they're told to, they keep shocking somebody. But when they vary those experiments and stage it so that someone else also doing, also following the commands stands up and says, this is wrong. I'm not doing this anymore. Other people tend to follow, right? There, There's a power. There's a power to somebody speaking the truth, right? To somebody articulating something. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, I, I would want to be a witness and I, I think that's partly out of the recognition of the need to be a witness that I feel so strongly about the need for truthfulness in the abortion debate. Right. Um, so I, um, I, I just gave, you know, I did this little debate at Glendale Community College and a girl got up in the question session um, and she, she said, well, you know, isn't adoption, isn't the answer just adoption? Sure, you don't want to have this this child, but, you know, you can do it for nine months, maybe should be compensated and then we'll just adopt the baby, right? That That's the answer. And now she was on, like, she was, the easy thing for me to do on my side of the debate is to say, yes, right? Yes. Um, but I don't think if you believe as I do that things are much more complicated than that, right? Um, I worked at a pregnancy center on Capitol Hill. I volunteered there for a while. I did data entry because they, they'd lost all their computer files. And uh, so I just did the intake forms. I entered the intake forms into the computer. That was my job. It was very interesting because in all the hundreds of intake forms that I entered, no woman ever checked yes to would you consider adoption, right? And and um, and I I think that's I think that matters, right? I think it's downright biblical. A woman's right. You do not <laughs> you do not want to give up give up. It's very hard to to bear a child, carry a child, give it up, and wonder the rest of your. I I don't even like being away from home at bedtime. OK, like I can't handle someone else putting my child to bed, like to not know if your child was hungry or cared for or loved. Right. It's hard. Right. But I so I but I think it's important for someone who's opposed to abortion, as I am, not to just be like, oh, OK, yes. Easy win. Yes. Adoption is the option. Right. Uh, because we actually have to acknowledge the complexity, right? And we have to, when, when our view, when aspects of our view are hard, when aspects of our view have less easy answers than you might imagine, you have, I think you have to own it and you have to be honest because you are, you are being a witness. I think you're right about that, right? You, you are kind of, people see through BS, right? People might not be the smartest people uh, here, you know, they might not be Mensa members, People see through BS, 
they know when you're, when you're just saying something for the sound effect or saying something for how it's going to sound or trying to win them over. People know that. It's, it's obvious. Um, and, and we just, we've got to stop doing that. And we do that so much in this country. We do it in politics. We do it on the news. And, and it, it just, I don't know, it, it irritates me, right? Because this is a, this is a, an important question, right? An all important question. If you're right, um, about human life and when it begins, um, there is a Holocaust going on in this country, right? And we're not, you know, in our eagerness to stop it, we can't just shove something down people's throats that they're not ready for, right? We have to be honest and we have to be understanding and we have to, um, we have to own the, that, the, that what we're asking of women is going to seem hard and unpleasant and countercultural. Right? Um, so now I just kind of went off topic and answered your with a with a big messy, um, long winded kind of thing. But there you go. No, that's that's helpful to me. Um, I was actually thinking about something that I, I I don't remember why I read this, but I haven't thought about this in like ten years. Um, <clears throat> like in the original dispensation, uh, the divine life would have been communicated through you know, like ordinary means. So a man and a woman come together in sexual intercourse, the child would have been begotten with grace in the sense that when God infused the soul, he would have communicated grace. With the loss of that, um, the kind of grand plan, as it were, fails. Uh, but now the subsequent dispensation is one of how much more. And I, yeah, I remember reading somewhere, I just remember the Latin word that the guy used because I remember it was a time where I was like, Latin words, mystery language, must be cool. But he was like, now we must be, must be reclaimed in the context of a friendship with Christ, single law team, uh, like one by one. And there's the sense in which, you know, what is true of salvation, writ large, right? What is true of Christ's redemption is true of the means that he deploys for its manifestation and communication until the end of the age. So if we are to be, you know, pulled back from the brink by a twitch upon the thread, it's going to be one by one, and it's going to be through, you know, like a friendship of a certain sort, you know, through a kind of, yeah, through a kind of communion, um, which is discouraging for those who deal in grand ideas and big plans, but it's, uh, it's true, and only the truth bears grace, so it's good. <laughs> no, I, look, I think, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, so this is a little bit off topic, but, um, you know, my husband worked for 24 years for a Senator, um, from Wyoming, really good man, great man. Um, you know, and a, as in the Senate, he passed all kinds of bills, right. By the, by the end, he was, you know, chair of the finance committee, Right. And, and, um, you know, you, you can look at, at someone like that and you can think, wow, such a good man did so much. How come the world's such a mess? Right. Because you, when we think about changing the world, we think about that. Right. We think about I passed 150 bills. I have all right. Shortly after he, his boss retired, um, six months after, right. He was in this freak accident and he died. And after, you know, in the days after his death, there was just this outpouring on social media of story after story after story from people who had met him, worked for him, uh, constituents, right? And all the stories were exactly the same. Every story was, I was nobody. And this man, this very powerful man, treated me like a human being, helped me Remet, wrote me a letter every year on the anniversary of my father's death, right? Reached out to me, right? This person who didn't have to saw my humanity. And reading those stories, I thought, you know what? He did change the world. He changed the world in exactly the same way that is open to every single one of us to change the world. And we don't do it because we sit there and we think, man, I wish I was in the Senate. I could pass a bill and change the world. Right. And the really hard thing is just to treat other people like human beings. Right. And to really listen. That's the way you change the world. Um, and we don't do it because it's it's hard and it's not um, it's not glamorous. Um, you never get any thanks. You never get any ego boosts. Um, but that's the way you change the world.
Boom. I'm convinced. Or if I were wholly convinced, I would probably comport myself differently. So I could <laughs> say that I'm the I'm on the way to being convinced. Well, I mean, I, I, I feel the have... same way about myself, <laughs> right? I mean, because um, not. I mean, you've got to be a certain kind of person to really show that kind of conviction in your life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a kind of a good virtuous note on which to end is to say that, you know, over the course of our lives, we ask ourselves not so much like what are the discrete acts that I hope to perform so much as who do I want to be on the other end or like who is the person I hope to become, not in like a self-regarding or navel-gazing kind of solipsistic way, but in the sense that like I want to be that person for the Lord, you know, for those whom I love. And I think that's a good way in which to focus. Yeah, the the abortion debate as well. It's not so much about demonstrative triumph as it is about, yeah, transformative witness. Uh, and yeah, as human beings with minds and hearts, it's going to, it's going to demand something of the whole of us. And so far as it's, yeah, it's, it's a big ticket item. So, huh. um, with that, I think we've come to the end of our time. So thanks so much for making the time. Thanks so much for uh, continuing the conversation. I certainly profited from it. And I sure. imagine that those who listen Absolutely. to it Absolutely. Thanks well. so much. I enjoyed it. Great. And then turning to you now, listener of the Thomistic Institute podcast, thanks so much for having tuned in. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe on your podcast app or on YouTube and get updates when other episodes come out. At this point, it's basically every day. So I don't know that you need much updating, but <laughs> there you have it. Okay, know of our prayers for you. Please pray for us, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on the Thomistic Institute podcast. Mm-hmm.